Excellent. So uh, once again, um, it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, Beatrice Gobbo from the Politecnico di Milano, then City Design. Beatrice and I work together in a project called AlgoCount, which stands for a long thing about algorithmic accountability um, that uh, both our universities collaboratively undertake and have been uh, working on for the last uh, year or so. Uh, Beatrice is a, a designer and a, and a researcher uh, who is completing a, a PhD dissertation on algorithms, if I, if I am correct. And, uh, um, and I'm, as I said, I'm particularly happy that she's here today to guide us through uh, data visualization in a way that none of us would actually be able to, uh, because she's an expert uh, other than us. And uh, so I will, uh, I will leave the floor to her for a presentation. And uh, of course, I'm here in case you need anything, Beatrice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessandro, for your introduction. I'm very happy to be here and thank you for inviting me. This is a pleasure. Um, I'm, okay, today, as also Alessandro told before, I am a PhD student. I'm actually writing my dissertation, third year, and I'm working in the design area, in the communication design area. Uh, today, we will work basically on two sides. At the beginning, I would like to introduce you to the world of data visualization and graphic uh, communication. And then we will try to do something all together with the raw graph, which is uh, a tool that allows you to build uh, data visualization. So I share my screen. Let me know if everything is working. Can you hear me? It's, it's, do you think that everything, everything is fine? Okay, so perfect. Yeah. So. Uh... Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. And now can you see the widescreen presentation? Yes. Okay, perfect. So again, thank you very much. Today I will talk about uh, visualizing for digital methods because uh, we are in a summer school of digital methods. So I will try to frame uh, this lecture, uh, making some examples coming from the digital method field. Uh, because actually we as a group of designers collaborated uh, sometimes uh, with the scholars uh, involved in digital method research. So I thought that uh, it should be a good starting point for, for this lecture. Um, before, just a brief recap on who we are. So I am a part of uh, the Density Design Research Lab, which is a research lab in Politecnico di Milano, in the design department of Politecnico di Milano. And we basically focus on the visual representation of complex phenomena and issues. Uh, we, during our, I mean, uh, during our time, we dedicate to different uh, side of uh, data visualization research. For instance, one of the last projects we worked on and uh, that we released is the Atlantic Albino, which is more related to the digital humanities and literature field, but we collaborated with uh, uh, scholars uh, from uh, uh, literature and we analyzed the work of uh, Italo Calvino, which is an Italian writer. Uh, then well, you probably know that project, which is a field guide to fake news. Uh, we also had some expertise in doing visualization related to um, understanding and trying to follow fake news on social network. This was, this was a book uh, that was released some years ago, uh, which is the result of a collaboration with also the Public Data Lab. And it's basically a collection of recipes aimed at showing ways in which we can uh, detect and follow fake news uh, on the on social network and on the web in general. Then uh, we are also part. Uh, I'm not really involved from. Uh, I'm not one of the the designer of this tool, unfortunately, uh, because it started many years ago when I I wasn't here. Uh, but we are also part of the development team of the Rograph tool, which is an open source and free tool for creating visualization and actually. The, uh, the tool that we are going, we will go, we are going to explore later, and then as also Alessandro was uh, was saying before, we are uh, we are also uh, working on this project which is called Algo Count uh, that is uh, aimed to uh, explore the public perception of algorithms in society, and we are working together. We are, don't have still some results, but we hope that we will have some results very very soon. Um, 
all in all all this all the slides are correlated with the link so then i will show i don't know if uh, the link of those slides is already a welcome package but uh, you can of course then uh, watch the slides and see all the slides and of course uh, uh, see all the links that are embedded into it so as i was just, i was saying before we will have basically three part of the lesson uh, the first part will be dedicated to explore the world of data visualization in terms of milestones and very important people that uh, uh, developed this uh, this field and these techniques. Uh, and then we will work on the row graphs and the role of annotation. And we will see later what do we mean with it. And then, of course, we will have some time for questions and answers. So the first thing that I wanted to talk, I mean, I want to discuss is uh, about what do we mean when we say data visualization. Every time that I don't know what I mean with something, uh, I used to go on Google Images <laughs> uh, because I think that it, it, a very, it's a very clear understanding of what uh, people think also that uh, Google, uh, that uh, data visualization in this case is. And if we look uh, at uh, um, these, uh, we can see that, for instance, data visualization is described with pictures and images that range from uh, infographics so graphics with colored shapes but also award-winning projects like this one or some very um, strange visualization that uh, it's very hard to understand what they're talking about and so on we can spend maybe one hour in understanding what is inside the data visualization but of course uh, this kind of uh, uh, first uh, glance give you an idea an overall idea of what commonly people is used to think uh, when we say data visualization. However, um, data visualization, I mean, the act of visualizing something is in very basic terms, uh, translating a table into a visual representation. We can have a table like in this case, uh, which is composed by tabular data, but we can have also a table or a folder of images like uh, Julia was uh, was presenting before with memes, for instance. But the idea of visualizing something is to translate a format into a visual representation. According to one of the definition that we can find on Wikipedia, um, we can detect some key terms involved in the description of uh, data visualization. Data visualization is viewed as by many disciplines as visual communication and involves the creation and the study of the visual representation of data. This sentence, uh, uh, I think that this sentence uh, actually um, emphasizes, uh, firstly, the multidisciplinary nature of this technique and this field, but also its multiple function. Data visualization activities involve both the creation and the study of the representation of data. And uh, this is the reason why I choose this sentence because during this lecture, we will go through those different aspects of, of data visualization. And I want to start from the first one. So the role of the designer of the data visualization, who does design the visualization? The expertise of the designer of data visualization has its roots into the histories of earliest map making and visual depiction and later into thematic cartography, statistics, statistic graphics, with some application that range from different domains. But if we come back to the first visualization ever, and this is coming from a paper I linked here, which is a brief history of data visualization, which is super interesting. If you have time, if you are interested in the topic, I would really uh, recommend it. The first visualization ever is about uh, the description of planetary movement. The author of this visualization is unknown, but we know that it was an astronomer because his, uh, this visualization is described or is used for uh, comment uh, the Somnium Scipionis by Cicero. And this, this visualization is really the first witness of a, a visual representation of a complex system, like in this case that was uh, the observe that was the result, the translation of the observation of the movement of planets. So it seems that astronomers were the first uh, that tried to visualize data in, uh, in the history of data visualization. Uh, with doing a big jump uh, in, in time, 
Uh, we have also this visualization by Skinner in 1626 uh, that actually uh, representing using those small visualization uh, how uh, the sunspots over time change from October 1611 to December of the same year. And we can see here that basically um, the use of visualization, even in this case, that has been exploited by experts in astronomy because the astronomy is something which is so far from us, is super complex, and uh, those kind of, uh, of experts need to represent uh, those, uh, those specific phenomena. Um, another important milestone that I want to, to suggest, if maybe also uh, look at it uh, in, uh, in, in details later, is the one represented by this visualization. Here, Langhan in 1644, um, which was another astronomer actually, uh, represented the distance between Rome and Toledo according to different scientists. So for instance, if you can see here, we have Toledo on the left and we and here the distance uh, from Toledo to Rome according to the measure measurements of different scientists. Like for instance, we have Mercator, which was one um, of the most known scientists and cartographer that designed one of the most famous projection maps that we, we have, like the, the classical maps we are used to, uh, to see here in Europe. And this is interesting because this visualization has been considered the first representation of statistical data. Because here, the author of the visualization was comparing uh, different uh, data, different data coming from different scientists. The previous visualization, as well as the one that I'm showing right now, are witnesses of the contemporary beginning of statistics. Because uh, uh, the author, of this visualization, which is uh, like 20 years later, uh, yes, yeah, 1662, yeah, 20 years later, um, were two mathematicians. Uh, the first one uh, collected data about uh, uh, mortality in London, and the second one designed this graph, which is a line chart that actually shows uh, the mortality um, in, in the city of London. <clears throat> and uh, this is interesting because uh, by comparing these two things, so the data collected and the visualization, we have the first testimonies of uh, the relation and the translation between something which is uh, data collected, in this case, where data collected by hand manually, and a visualization. This is like the turning point of data visualization when talking about the statistics. Then um, Edmund Halley, uh, which is the one famous for the comet of Halley. Uh, he was an astronomer, again, but also a geographist, a geographist, a mathematician, and a meteorologist. Um, he developed the use of contour lines on map. I don't know if you, maybe, maybe you, you, you are used to see some uh, uh, weather reports uh, on TV or on the web. And basically, he designed these, uh, these contour plots that are now commonly used to describe meteorological variation. And this is the first uh, visual representation of this kind of, uh, um, of visual model on the map. Then uh, one of the most challenging, so we have seen how to represent data a long time, I mean, a long time, we have seen how to represent data on a map, but actually the time series has been for years, the most challenging uh, visual model uh, to, to develop and to design. And this is the reason why I wanted to show you this very crazy visualization, because it's not only visualization, but it's actually a contraption, a strange contraption containing a very long paper, piece of paper, long 16 meter and a half, containing the history of all the time <laughs> from, uh, from the beginning of uh, of the earth uh, to 1753. And this visualization is like a paper that the users can scroll. Let's imagine that we have a scrolling website. Okay, this, this is the ancestor of a, of a scrolling website. And here, all the time, the timeline of all the history uh, of the world is, uh, is depicted. And uh, the author of this visualization was the work who was a physician, but also a botanist. So he had a very specific domain. 
Then some years later, we have uh, the, um, the birth. I mean, we assisted to the birth to more complex uh, visualization. But what is interesting here, uh, by looking at this visualization by William Playfair, is that uh, um, the topic of those visualizations started to be more related to, uh, like in this case, uh, revenues, expenditure, debt, prices. So something which is really close to uh, country, the state, cities, and so on. And William Playfair is a very important in the, in the story of uh, data visualization because it started to define the main visual models. So in this case, you can see the first uh, example of a multiple line chart. But of course, it also, and if you, if, you have, if you have a look at the paper, you can see that it also uh, worked a lot in bar chart and pie chart. Then um, I want to tell you this story because also this story uh, behind this visualization is a very interesting turning point. And there is also a movie which is called Snow uh, that uh, tells the story of these, uh, this visualization, but also of this uh, period of time. Um, the, the author of the visualization is John Snow, uh, which is not the most famous John Snow. Um, and the, in this visualization uh, is the, depicted uh, the amount of death uh, during the London cholera in 1854. So as you can see here, uh, John Snow uh, designed um, a small bar chart on top of each uh, uh, house. So in order to understand how many people died uh, in, each, uh, in each building. And then by designing this visualization, he understood in the end, which was the source of cholera. Because if you can see here, for instance, we have a very, I mean, a big bar chart, which is close to a water pump. And this was the reason why here we had so many deaths uh, by cholera, because cholera was, uh, was delivered by, by water and in general, yes, by water. And here there was a pub, I guess, also. So it was like a space. Um, a space where people were drinking and uh, water and beer, for instance. Then um, another interesting point, uh, I mean, very important because this is the first uh, woman that actually uh, designed visualization in, uh, in the history, which is Florence Nightingale. She was a nurse and she wanted to depict the causes of mortality in the army. And uh, this is uh, interesting because actually she used this very uh, crazy visual model for representing uh, soldiers that were wounded or that died during uh, the, the army. And this was um, really, I mean, this was a very turning, a turning point because for the first time, first a woman <laughs> designed this kind of uh, visualization. And secondly, uh, in this case, uh, we really see someone on the, on the field, someone which is uh, directly involved in what is happening, designed, uh, design data for understanding something more. And then I wanted to, to close uh, this uh, first collection of a visualization with this map by Joseph Minard, which was a civil engineer that in 1869 designed this uh, Napoleon's Army March, which has been considered like one of the most uh, beautiful visualization uh, ever, uh, where he described how soldiers uh, during uh, the Napoleon's uh, March, uh, how French soldiers uh, went to Moscow, and in the the, the pink flow uh, tells uh, the uh, I mean the size of the pink uh, the pink flow. Uh, represent the amount of soldiers uh, that uh, uh, went to Moscow and the dark and the black uh, flow represent the soldiers that actually came uh, to came again to came back to France. As you probably know, this march was uh, like uh, terrible because uh, many soldiers died. They were not really to uh, very strict, uh, I mean, uh, very low temperature because it was very cold. And so you can see that actually the amount of soldiers that um, 
that departed from the from, from France and the amount of soldier that came back to France is quite different. So we have this big flow at the beginning, red, uh, red pink, and this small, small, small uh, flow, which is, uh, which is black. And this is interesting because uh, Minard, as a civil engineer, started to think to some code. Um, so for instance, uh, he used also a timeline here in, um, in the bottom part of the visualization for showing the temperature. So you, if you look at here, if you look in details of the visualization, you can see that he decided to annotate the visualization for giving users, the users, readers, more information about uh, this march and also for giving um, explanation uh, of the reason why there were, for instance, death. Uh, like here, you can see, I don't know if you can see my, my, my mouse, but maybe I can do something, no. Uh, here, where there is a, a river, you can see that there are, I mean, before the river, the soldiers were many, <laughs> and then after the river, soldiers were much more or less. And this is, for instance, uh, and examples of uh, the, the amount of death uh, uh, of soldiers while passing a river. Of course, uh, I can say here to talk about the story of visualization in that and how basically from Joseph Minard, we arrived to data visualization as we can look for in uh, Google images. But of course, this is not uh, my, my intention right now. But what I want to say is that basically, the role that uh, designers of data visualization had in the history is various, but what we can say is that they came from different disciplines. So they were physicians, statisticians, astronomers, mathematicians, botanists, nurses, doctors, civil engineers, and now if we want to make a, a comparison with uh, the actual uh, situation, we can say that we have computer scientists uh, or mechanical engineers or whatever. Everybody does visualization. This is what I want to say. But uh, um, there, I mean, something happened at a certain at a certain point, because starting with what friendly, which is the author of uh, of this paper, uh, calls the data visualization renaissance so between 1950 and 1975, there began to be a need to establish rules, uh, guidelines for data visualization designer. So we need, we started to need something uh, more concrete for developing and designing uh, uh, valuable data visualization. So if on the one hand, disciplines such as data science uh, were born, on the other end, uh, we see this uh, guy, which is Jacques Bertin, which was a cartographer, that in 1967, he wrote this book, Semiologie Graphique, um, that is considered one of the most interesting book uh, and uh, valuable book uh, in, uh, in the context of data visualization. And someone said that he did for graphics what Mendeleev had done for the organization of the chemical elements. Um, because he, Jacques Bertin, is a cartographer, so he was used to work with uh, uh, maps uh, and visualization on top of maps, he started to define the visual variables. So a specified a set of symbols or marks, uh, with colors, shape, and so on, that can be applied to data in order to translate information. This is an example. I mean, this is the figure that is, con it is, is contained in this book. And basically he defined these uh, seven visual variables. So in the middle, we have the position of the item. So we can we have these visual variables that help us in encoding data and representing them. And so here on the left, you can see the, um, the summary of the visual variable. Uh, every time that you design a visualization, you have to consider the position of the items, the size of the items, the shape, the orientation, the color, the texture, you can encode these data. I mean, you can encode the different data using different variables. And here on the right, uh, you have, you can see some experiments that done by Jacques Bertin in order to, um, to test uh, his visual variables. And what he 
said to, to us, <laughs> what he left to us is that actually, if you think that, that you can encode as many variables as you want, so you can also build the visualization with all the visual variables. But this is not, um, this, is, this doesn't mean that then the users, the reader of the visualization will decode all of them. So we can encode that data and visual variable, but we don't know how many of them the users will be able to decode. So what is important is always to, for instance, um, is always to understand which are the most important visual variables. So for instance, I would like to use color for representing something which is very important. Why, for instance, the texture, which is not really visible, maybe it's not so important. So every time that you design a visualization, you have to take into consideration uh, that there are those visual variables, but uh, even if you use all, all of them, probably the final user won't understand them. And this is the reason why I wanted to introduce these second uh, very important people uh, of the data visualization, which is Edward Tufty, who has also been called as ET. Uh, he was a, stati is, is a statistician, a computer scientist, and a political scientist. And among all the valuable work that uh, he did, he taught about the data ink ratio. Um, that uh, he presented in this book, uh, uh, The Visual Display of Quantitative Information in 1983. And this uh, kind of uh, discourse is really linked to the idea of using uh, many variables, uh, many, many graphical elements uh, in, in a visualization, because actually the data ink ratio is the proportion between the ink on the paper or the pixel on the screen used for representing data and the total ink used for printing the graphic. So what Edward Tufty wanted to see is that as designers of data visualization, we should avoid to build the visualization like the one that you see on the right, because we have some elements like the grid, the background color that are not useful for understanding. We just need something which is like a very minimal, but is enough to be clear. So basically the data ink is the minimal uh, amount of ink that you can use for printing your, your data. And for that reason, I want also to uh, introduce Alberto Cairo, uh, which is a contemporary researcher on, and also like a star in the visualization, uh, that uh, he wrote uh, many books, but I think that one of the most interesting is the functional art, uh, in which uh, he tried to understand uh, the um, functional, uh, I mean, the function and I mean, the functional side and the artistic side of data visualization. And this is something that actually collides with the idea of data interracial, or at least uh, it's, uh, it, it deserves to be explored and, uh, and it deserves a kind of discourse on it. Because what Alberto Cairo said is that graphics should clarify messages and should reveal realities not visible before. But, uh, we have to pay attention on the way in which uh, we communicate those data. So if you look at these two graphs, two visualization, let's say, on the left, we have, um, I mean, this girl that uh, using uh, the leg shows a, a, a line chart. And on the right, we have the same line chart, but represented in a very minimalistic way. Uh, Alberto Cairo said that uh, on the left uh, we have the a representation that could be a representation that could be done by graphic designers, artistic or journalists, and on the left, on the right, sorry, we have a representation that could have been done by someone with technical backgrounds, such statistics or computer science, whatever. However, I think that uh, I think, but we think as com as communication design and information design. Uh, um, community that there is something in between that, that we should manage. Uh, and I think that is exactly the way in which we balance the 
uh, minimal version of, uh, of the visualization and the amount of other details that can add information to our visualization that can actually provide a good reading of our data set. Because actually, what, when we think to data visualization, we have to think to something that helps us in diving complexity. So complexity is not something which is complicated. So it's not something that we have to untangle, but it's something that we have to understand from, uh, from a deeper, uh, maybe um, from a deeper view or maybe from far, maybe with something which uh, is uh, mechan its mechanisms are, are hidden or are too small or are too big. But what is important in this representation and study of the complexity that uh, you always face while working with data coming from the web, multidimensional data, um, picture and whatever, is that every time showing complexity means making choices. And uh, we have every time to take into consideration that data is not neutral and neither visualization do. And this is the reason why I want to introduce uh, uh, this woman, which is Joanna Dracker. Uh, she said that data are capta. In Italian, we would say, il dato non è dato, data is not given, data is taken, is constructed, and is uh, the result of an interpretation of the reality or the phenomenon. And this is the reason why I want to uh, also talk about her and another woman that actually uh, in the recent year uh, made a step uh, forward uh, because they started to talk and to think uh, the visualization as a process of knowledge production. And this is the reason why I want to tell you also because we are doing a digital method uh, summer school. So we know to produce knowledge using data. And Joanna Dracker, which is a visual theorist and a cultural critic, so we are talking about someone who is not a statistician, she is not an astronomer, she is not a graphic designer, so she's a theory, she's a theorist. Um, she uh, focused her research on the way in which through visualization we can produce uh, knowledge. So which are those actions that we as designer or domain expert or scientist or whatever can do on visualization for producing new knowledge and for understanding how the visualization is helping us in producing new knowledge again. And I would like also to uh, suggest you to have a look at the work of Uta Hendricks. Uh, she was actually a designer and a digital humanist, and I'm super happy because I'm now working with her. So I, <laughs> I, I really think that she's one of the uh, most, in my opinion, um, interesting and valuable uh, designer in data visualization right now. She wrote this paper, which is in defense of sand castles, because she, um, she uses the metaphor of sand castle for explaining the way in which visualization uh, could help us in producing knowledge. And the fact that the knowledge production uh, helped by visualization and the act that we can do <clears throat> on visualization is something which is cross-disciplinary and multidisciplinary. So basically what we can say is that data visualization is multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary field, whose notion derived from experiences of researchers and practitioners in different domains. And we, we, we saw from the beginning of the history of data visualization, and we also have some confirmation uh, now uh, where visualization is used as a tool for producing information in very uh, complex and multidisciplinary uh, teams or systems. And the Digital Method School and Data Sprint, for instance, are witnesses of this multidisciplinarity. Because for instance, I, I'm talking as from my personal experience, every time that I've been part of a Digital Method Summer School or other Data Sprint, I really felt the um, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary um, feeling. So I, I, I was really, um, I was really happy to work with people coming from different backgrounds. Now, I don't know which are your background, 
but I think that, uh, I mean, you probably come from, from different background. And uh, for that reason, I think that data visualization is a very valuable tool for also uh, communicating with people coming from different background on the same topic, on the same phenomena, and for understanding more and, know, and, product, and, production, and producing more knowledge. And this is the reason, again, why I want to present to you, uh, before starting with the more technical part, uh, some cases coming from digital method schools or digital method works, um, and the way in which visualization are constructed uh, in these uh, specific uh, uh, occasions. Uh, this is a visualization done by one of my colleagues, Tommaso Elli, uh, during the last DMI uh, summer school in Amsterdam or winter school, winter school. And basically, this is a network that shows the conspiratorial books for the query COVID on Amazon and the way in which they highlighted some books helped in detecting different type of, uh, of connection, for instance. And the network shows some recommendation at the, first, at the level one depth from a first selection of results in Amazon. And this is interesting because actually you can see that the center of the network uh, have the most conspirational books. So basically Amazon very quickly recommend to you conspirational books by looking COVID, I mean, by, by searching for COVID. Then I added this, uh, this slide because I was triggered by the, the example that uh, Julia uh, did on uh, Meme Spector, uh, because actually we had uh, during one digital method school in, uh, in Lisbon, uh, we had the opportunity to work on uh, the way in which a different Google Vision API recognize the same bunch of images. And I wanted just to show it to you, and maybe you can also visit the website, uh, which was that this visualization was aimed to uh, compare different semantic spaces of Microsoft Azure, IBM Watson, and Google Vision um, API, according to different keywords that we use for scraped images. And this, this, in this case, we overlapped all the image label networks, and then we filtered them for API, and we detected, for instance, here uh, that uh, Google Vision is a very expert language. So in those network, all the, uh, the, the keywords related to very specific domain uh, were highlighted only when talking about Google Vision. So for instance, Google Vision, instead of saying, I don't know, um, red, uh, would say um, coral, something like that. And this was a very interesting project. And we also used this way of comparing networks by using these metrics in order to show similarities and, uh, and differences among uh, different networks and different cases. Then another, another case that uh, I want to show you, and even this one is in a certain way related to what uh, Julia told you before, because this is, uh, is related to memes and to the irony. During this uh, uh, summer school, uh, we worked on uh, the, the rhythm of irony on a specific page on Facebook in this case, which was the Dunk for Life memes uh, page on Facebook. And we tried to understand if there was a way for um, uh, detecting and uh, designing, visualizing the rhythm of a irony uh, in a page by analyzing all the posts uh, in the news feed, in the news feed, in the in the in in the page of uh, these dunk pro life memes. And uh, we create this visualization, which is a very basic visualization. This is are basically six scatter plots, one on top of the other, um, according to different reactions, so the, the amount of different reaction on Facebook. Mm, and we highlighted some, some cases, so some specific memes that we considered outliers, uh, because there were those memes that had maybe a different reaction uh, according to the other. Uh, and we tried to represent those memes by annotating the visualization. So we selected the specific time in which that meme appeared 
and we use the picture of the actual memes for um, highlighting this. And this is something that we are used to do many times when we work in digital methods, summer school or in data sprint, because uh, we believe in the power of annotation. And this is the reason why I want to work on annotation later on, uh, because uh, the role of annotation, I mean, the annotation itself is a way for producing knowledge for firstly for producing knowledge, but also for communicating knowledge. So the way in which you annotate your visualization, you can print it, you can annotate it, and you can use the visualization for producing new knowledge with your teammates or for sharing your visualization on MapPorn or Reddit and say, oh, what happens here, for instance. Um, then uh, this, I guess, last example from uh, the fake news uh, uh, project, uh, this was uh, this is a network uh, that show Facebook page. Um, but what is important here is not uh, the topic. You can have a look at this later, but it's the way in which annotation are designed. You can see that uh, we have uh, different type of information on this uh, on this visualization. First of all, on the left, we have a title and a description. So every time that you design a visualization, don't forget the title and the description, which is fundamental for understanding which is the um, research question, what are you talking about, for instance. Then we have a, a group of annotations and labels, like for instance, here we have the name of the cluster. You can see that those cluster have been overlaid to the visualization in order to emphasize some groups of pages and as have been also labeled according to the content. Then we have also a legend, which is very important, which is something that, I mean, title and legend are the fundamental and yes, fu fundamental elements that you should um, design for making a visualization understandable, both if you are using this visualization for communicating with your colleague, but also if you're using this visualization, for instance, for presenting data on uh, a slideshow. And then, which is a very interesting, is this part of suggestions. So it's maybe, it's like um, a, a crop of the main visualization, highlighting some specific case, some zoom, some other, new readings that people can do from can do from 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 this visualization so as a wrap up of this first uh, uh, pack of information uh, what we can say is that data visualization is a multidisciplinary field so where different um, experts from different domain uh, can work together data visualization could be seen as a tool to dive into complexity. And for diving into complexity, uh, we have to think that the visualization is a process of choices. So what I want to visualize, I want to visualize these set of data, I want to filter data, which annotation I want to add to my visualization for making readers understanding what I want to say. So for that reason, we say that data visualization is a process, not only the final output, but it's something that could be also evolving thing, like it could be thought as an evolving item, as an evolving artifact, uh, artworks, whatever. And that data visualization, of course, is not neutral because data are capta. So you both are doing a, a choice while visualizing, but you're also doing a choice while you are collecting and gathering data. And this is very, very important. Okay, so this is the first part of the lesson. Uh, then we would focus on uh, play with uh, with raw grass. So I don't know, maybe there are some questions right now, or if you prefer, I don't know, if someone want to um, want to add something or ask for more information, something maybe was not clear. Come on. Okay. Yes. Oh, no. Okay. I can go. Any questions? Any comments so far?
I think we can proceed then. Okay, cool. Thank you, Diego, for the positive comment. Okay, cool, perfect. Okay, thank you. Let's go on. Okay, okay. Uh, this uh, section is called Let's Play. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's like the end of the morning, so we need to just a little bit uh, relax. Uh, wait, wait. Okay, so the idea for these uh, last uh, 40 minutes, more or less, uh, one hour, will be to um, produce design this visualization this is not super good this is something that is very is raw but the idea is to uh, step is to, to um, do a step-by-step -step exercise that you can follow or then you can watch uh, uh, the recording and do it again it's just to repurpose this uh, visualization adding annotation and and so on so we will say we will see all together how to deal with it uh, for doing that, we will use raw graphs. We will see it's just uh, in, a, in, a, in a couple of minutes. Uh, raw graph, as I was, as I was mentioning before, uh, is an open source uh, tool and a free tool um, that allows you to create uh, data visualization from spreadsheet. And uh, when do you need raw graphs? When basically regular graphs uh, are unable to show the complexity of data. So uh, maybe <clears throat> on, on Excel, uh, for instance, you can design visualization like bar chart or now they are the last version of Excel are actually providing some more complex visual models. But of course, Excel is not free, is not open source, uh, while raw graph is free and open source. And actually, raw graphs is a link, is, is thought as a link between spreadsheet and visualization and has been developed. Uh, the first version has been developed in 2009, more or less. And now, I mean, from 2019, we are developing a new version of raw graph 2.0 uh, together with the Studio Calibro and in Magic, which is a, 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 a studio for uh, developing uh, projects. And uh, what is interesting is that raw graphs uh, both allows you to create uh, like PNG, JPEG images for visualization, but also vector-based visualization uh, because it's based on top, I mean, it's, it's built on top of the D3JS library by Mike Bostock. D3JS library is a library um, and is coded in JavaScript. And D3 is, uh, because it's data-driven documents that actually provides so many blocks of different visual models that are connected to, to data. The, all those visual models are interactive and you can do many, many, many things for customizing them. <clears throat> what it's important to say is that RoGraph, it's a client-based application. So you can use your data, you can connect your data to RoGraph, but RoGraph won't steal your data, but will process data only by the web browser. So you, you can also use sensitive data, for instance. And uh, what RoGraph uh, works with the tabular data, so spreadsheet, uh, comma separated values, and you can very easily copy and paste or connect your data set to this, uh, to this application, which is a web application. Um, we, I mean, we can, for now, we can only work with tabular data. I don't know in the future if we will have something for working with picture or whatever, or sound, I don't know. But uh, every time that we talk about tabular data, which data are we talking about? In general, we can make this distinction uh, among uh, metrics and list, like proper a form, like a, a format of data. So we have the metrics, uh, which in this case is also the unstacked version of a data set, where like is here, we have the three, a brand, like three brand, like H&M, Zara and Gucci. And then we have two columns with sustainability value, with the value here at the, um, at the crossroads of the column and the rows, and another column with another, another, another value. And this is the metrics. 
So all of these are results of the uh, cross of uh, the brand and the value. While here in the list, uh, we have uh, the stacked uh, version, which is narrow, where we have all the brand and we have repeated all the variables. So H and M that for the variable sustainability value has a value of 32. So uh, they are basically saying the same thing, but they're organized in a different way. And I'm saying this because uh, for instance, for row graphs, uh, uh, you should need a different type of organization of, of format of, of the data set for producing a different visual models. So for instance, the metrics is useful when you have to uh, design a, a matrix, of course, or a dispersion plot or a network, while the list is useful when you have, you need, for instance, to produce a time series or a flow. I talked about visual models. So this is uh, one of the screen of RoGraph. We have uh, so many visual models, more or less 20 or 25, I don't know, 25, I think. And visual models are uh, in very basic work, the type of visualization that are we, we are using. So we have, uh, for instance, the bar chart is a visual model that you probably know. The bubble chart is a visual model. The dendrogram, which is the tree representation leaf, this one is a visual model. And you are free to explore all of them when, when you have time. Um, here uh, we have, or then we will see uh, live later, but basically all those uh, visual models in Bograss are uh, grouped by uh, type so for or by type or by um, type of uh, uh, visualization and and the type of data that i want to show type of relation of data that i want to show like for instance we have all that visual models that allows me to show correlation all those visual models that allow me to show time series and so on like for instance in this case uh, there are all the visual models that are aimed to show correlation, like for instance, the Alouette diagram, which is this one with flows that uh, uh, correlate to different categories. Um, I left here a visualization of the visual models. So basically here we have all the visual models that are present in, in row graphs and here all the different categories. And by looking at this metrics, so you can easily see, okay, alluvial diagrams is for correlation and proportion. Distribution, okay, I can see the bees worm and I can see the box plot and so on. This could be useful. But um, be, um, I mean, uh, try to be careful because uh, as I told you, graph 2.0 is still a beta version. So uh, we are still developing it. And so, for instance, categories can change. And so maybe uh, now categories are different, or maybe you can see new visual model coming up uh, uh, tomorrow. <clears throat> but this is also something which is uh, valuable and interesting. Uh, what is interesting, I mean, just uh, something before, before starting. Um, in general, uh, one data set can allow you to create different visual outputs. So from, from the same data set, you can create so many different visualizations according to what you want to show, according to which is your uh, research question. So the idea is that you have your data set, you analyze, you see your data set, and then you choose a visual model that better uh, allows you to um, show and to answer to your research question. I don't know. Okay, maybe I can send you the slide. Yes, I know. Maybe Alessandro, you have the link of the slide. You can also share it. I don't know. Anyway. Sorry, say again. I will. Sorry. Say again, please. No, that maybe you can share the link of the slide. I don't know if they are already in the in the welcome package. Uh, um, no, I, I can send it later after the lesson. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, okay. So some friendly tip uh, tips before starting with raw graph. Um, I will leave it them here, but uh, actually. Um, okay, then you can also always have a look at them because also for me, sometimes it's difficult to uh, remind everything. But in general, 
when you work with the tabular data on row graphs, you don't, you don't have to forget that you have to use points to describe decimals, so 0 0.2. And if you want to describe thousands, you have to delete point, comma, whatever. You should use the American format date. Uh, now with the new version, you can also change uh, um, among languages, but uh, I mean, to me, it's always better to use the American date format. Um, then if you want to use a URL from Google Drive, because you can also connect, we will see how to do it. You can also connect your Google spreadsheet to um, row graph. You have to make public uh, your spreadsheet before. We will see how to do it together. In row graph 2.0, you can use the same template for different data sets with the same data structure because you can download the project uh, as a JSON file and you can also code it. So if someone of you is uh, uh, familiar with uh, JavaScript, HTML and CSS can also customize uh, his her um, visualization on, on row graphs, uh, I mean, customize the, like the code behind the visualization. But row graph is powerful because basically allows to any one of us of creating visualization without coding anything. So this is just a front end thing. So, um, okay, this is, uh, I mean, the, the topic, the experiment that I want to use as a sample for visualizing a bunch of data, uh, is coming from an experiment that I did after a work that we did together during an algo count uh, data sprint. So the project that I'm working with uh, together with Alessandro and I worked with, with Julia and Ricardo, Ilir and other from, uh, from your group. And um, I basically collected some information about uh, new speed and like activity of different users, uh, newborn users on Facebook in order to understand how information about uh, vaccine uh, spread in a new speed, uh, a new speed of page of, of Facebook. Okay, this is not important. By starting from the word vaccino in Italian. And my main question was, which are the main differences in the Facebook news feed between users with and without the Facebook of activity? So as I said before, the news feed is the, um, the list of items of post of the news that appears in, uh, in, a, user, in a user page file on Facebook. And the off activity is the summary of activity that uh, ADS and the organization share with us. So for doing that, um, this was a second experiment because during the AlgoFund project the data sprint, I did it manually, then I did it uh, using a tracking exposed add-ons. Tracking exposed is a group of uh, activists that developed some tools for um, auditing platforms uh, such as Facebook, uh, such as Amazon or YouPorn. And I used these add-ons for collecting data about, uh, um, about the two different users, one with off, of, off activity on Facebook and one without uh, off activity on Facebook. Uh, all, uh, then I will show you the, the protocol like here. Okay, sorry. Um, this was the, the step that I did for collecting data. Basic, basically, it was an experiment that I carried on uh, in more or less 10 days. And uh, um, I basically collected information for two, two kinds of users uh, by using always uh, a browser without uh, uh, any information about uh, myself. Uh, and uh, using, for instance, Brave browser without uh, uh, without anything, basically super, super, super uh, pure uh, environment. And uh, I mean, this is the result of, of the of the protocol, where basically, basically I collected different different uh, news feed for both of the of the users. And uh, during this process of collecting news feed, I was all also 
liking suggestive pages. So starting from the query vaccino, I started to also liking pages day by day, according to suggestion of Facebook, and then recording the news feed. And the difference between the no off activity uh, user and the off activity user is that is that for the Facebook off activity user, which was Cirilla, uh, don't ask me why this name, but I randomly generated it. Um, I started the pollution. So I started to pollute the data set by visiting websites on, uh, on the browser, on the same browser, uh, by looking for symptom vaccine COVID, so COVID vaccine symptoms on Google and open the first four results and accepting cookies, of course. Then I created this data set. I also, uh, I'm also sharing with you the link and this folder, then you can play with it. Those data sets are not still ready. So maybe you would find some typos or maybe some errors, but the idea is that I would like to work with those uh, data. Uh, those data are uh, basically the first column of this data set is about the users. So two different users. We have Cirilla Milano, which is the first randomly generated user uh, that I created, uh, which is, I also uh, added um, age to her, even always randomly generated. And he was born in 2002. And then the other one, which is Costanzo Sabatini, uh, their name are Italian because uh, we are working in the Italian sphere for the Algocon project. So we're using also Italian uh, name for people. And here I collected with the add-on uh, day by day, uh, more or less. I mean, one day and then I stopped for one day and then one day and so on. I collected all the posts, I mean, all the posts appearing on my newsfeed. So those are all the posts on my newsfeed. And so in here you have the publisher name, so the name of the, of the page appearing. The amount of like for each page. And in this case, the type of data. So those data are data related to the newsfeed. Um, then if you look on the bottom here, I also added these uh, uh, data, which are related to the like activity. So here I have um, the date in which Cirilla or Costanzo Sabatini started to like those pages. For creating the visualization that I wanted to work with uh, with you in. Uh, in a, couple of, uh, in a couple of minutes, uh, I also added these columns uh, where basically those two are the most important, where basically I highlighted those pages that contained uh, vaccine in the vaccino in, in the name of the page. So for instance, I created this Boolean uh, column with yes or no. So for instance, okay, these, page, which is called Referendum sulla libertà di, di scelta sul vaccino, has uh, vaccino, the word vaccino is inside this, the name of the page, so I decided, uh, like, in a very, um, this is not really scientific, but was just for showing you a way for uh, making some categories. If I had more time, I would, uh, like, uh, categorize uh, all those pages according to the type of, uh, of information that they're used to share. So for instance, news, uh, lifestyle, uh, news, uh, news, uh, I don't know, which is something that, for instance, we did together with, uh, with Ricardo during the Algocon project uh, data sprint. So this is more or less the data set, but it's just an example. You can use it, uh, reuse it, but you can also uh, experiment with one of your favorite data set. And uh, so this is the link to, 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 to the data set and to, to the folder with the presentation data set and also some, uh, some references that are not in the, in the slides. Maybe I can, I don't know if I can just share it like in the chat. Let's do it. Let's do it like this so you can access everything. 
right now. It's bit.ly DM the DM Como Pizza. So it's quite okay. And so we will go to a graph and we will do something like this. So, so okay, let's go to a graph. So this is the oops. This is the main link, rowgraphs.io. I will send it in the chat as well. Okay. So, okay, this is uh, the, the landing page of Rograph. Um, I'm really glad to announce that uh, we have uh, the new learning videos. So basically this year we ha you have some section uh, the about, uh, where everything is described about the way in which you can use your graph, uh, the way in which you can cite it, uh, the blog uh, that contains some, um, some information about uh, the la latest release, and then the learning part, uh, which is very important uh, because uh, all the uh, elements, all the, the elements of the list in the learning part uh, explain user how to make a specific visual model. So for instance, this is an example of how to make an hexagonal building. And uh, there are also some videos tutorial that step-by-step uh, -step explain everything about that specific visual model. So you can really explore it uh, and spend uh, a day <laughs> in uh, uh, exploring uh, all the functionalities behind uh, a single visual model. Then we have the gallery, which is a collection of a visualization coming from different uh, uh, domains or people. So we have a visualization done with, uh, with raw graph always as a basis, and then that have been embed embedded in contexts like uh, a magazine or website, whatever. Then, of course, but the sponsor are not really important. What is important is the documentation because. Of course, as I was talking to you, if you are familiar with uh, programming and JavaScript and HTML and CSS, you can create a, a branch uh, on, uh, on RoGraph and you can basically uh, create your personal version of uh, the, uh, the platform. And so you can do whatever you want. You can create your custom visualization that are maybe useful for specific data that you are used to produce. So uh, use it now is the button that actually uh, push us to the main interface of, of RoGraph. As I was saying to you before, um, you can um, connect tabular data and you can do it in uh, four ways, basically. You can paste your data. So I can go to my spreadsheet. I can copy them and paste here in, uh, in the graph. And I, I would see everything. So the same table here. Or by resetting, I can upload a CSV. I can try one of the samples that are available on the graph. But, and this is super useful. I can also enter a web address. Let's, for instance, if I am on the um, on Google spreadsheet, I can publish to the web this sheet. So from file, I publish to the web. Instead of publishing the entire document, I just publish the sheet number one. I publish the comma separated value, uh, not the web page. Uh, if I click on publish, okay, I'm sure. Yes, I'm sure. Um, mm, 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 I can copy this link and put it no, no, no. and paste it here. Okay, and I have the same kind of information that I had before when I was copy and pasting. Why is important this is because if I want to change, let's say. the name of uh, a column, I can do it uh, and row graph by changing. Oh no, OK. 
again is okay so it will update i guess so it's not updating but he used to do this what is happening here it's strange wait i have something strange happening let me do it again okay again file file publish to the web something to the connection something strange okay uh, sheet one comma separated value comment and here okay 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 exactly we, we we couldn't see before this button probably there was something with string but anyway you can refresh data from url and once you refresh you can see again uh, i mean see the data set uh, as you modified or edited it on the uh, google spreadsheet so this is the space where you can uh, insert your your data you can check it, uh, you can check that uh, all the measure, I mean, all the format all of the column are right. So for instance, this is a number and I want that this is a number or this is uh, a string and I want that this is a string. Once everything is fine and that this button is uh, gray, green, eh? because for instance, let's say that here I don't put anything or here I put like a string it should say something okay it should say okay pay attention at line uh, 50 uh, 510 you have uh, a problem so okay so basically don't remember so basically this is important because every time you can pay, have some problem okay let's refresh so we okay okay so that's it and this is the way in which you upload the data. Then if you scroll down, you can choose a chart. So as I was saying to you before, we have so many charts, different type of charts, different categories. Okay, you see, as before, in, in the screenshot that I took like two weeks ago, probably, uh, there were so many uh, categories. Now there are less categories. But for instance, if I want to show a time series, let's say, Okay, I can filter all the visual model and I can see, for instance, the visual plot, which is the visual model that we are going to use for visualizing those data. But of course, we can also experiment with bump chart or line chart or matrix plot, whatever among those. But actually we want to show a, um, a time series because we want to see how um new speed change across time um, by comparing to different type of user one with uh, facebook of activity and the other one without facebook of activity okay once i've chosen my uh my my visual model i click on it and i scroll down okay by scrolling down I have uh, these uh, this kind of interface. I don't know if uh, someone of you has ever worked with uh, Tableau, uh, which is another software for creating visualization. It's much more technical, I guess, but the idea here is quite similar. So you have to drag and drop the dimension into chart variables. Chart variables are those things that will appear in the uh in the visualization so for instance the position on the x-axis the size the color the label this is the series the order of the groups and us and those chart variables are basically the same variables that jacques bertin in 1976 uh, uh, defined in semi graphic. So the x-axis is the position, the size is the size, the color is the color. So you see here why, uh, who said that uh, he did the, the same thing that Mendeleev did for <laughs> chemistry was right. Because luckily we are still using uh, the definition that uh, Bertin did for uh, visual variables in those kind of application, which are very far from what uh, uh, Bertin was was doing uh, 70, 80 years ago. Okay, so here we have to basically 
drag and drop our columns into chart variables. So what we want to show as the position. Position is, be, is going to be the date. And if you scroll down, you see that the visualization starts to appear. So here we have the date, so from uh, 13 of April to 20 of April. Then we want to um, divide our, um, our bees worm into four different groups. One group is the one uh, devoted to show the news feed, I mean, the, the different page that appeared on the news feed of our user Cirilla, which is the one with Facebook of activity. The other one is the one devoted to show the news feed of Costanzo, who had not Facebook of activity. And then we want also to compare the like activity, so not the news feed activity, but what they liked both Cirilla and Costanzo. So we needed those four groups basically, which are the ones contained in this uh, column, which is the, uh, now it's by, but was basically type two before, okay? So we, okay, type two, you know, this is- still Sorry, really... Patricia. Si? Can I ask you uh, what type of chart are you using before? Oh, because- uh... Sure, I'm using the beeswarm plot. Okay, because I had uh, another access and now so huh. okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Cool. Uh, let me know if everything is fine. Uh, this is beeswarm plot, and basically is a plot that allows to show distribution over time of elements, and uh, we can use only one group, like in this case, one series, but we can also split this group in different series. So for instance, if I drag and drop this type to here in series, okay, you see that the beeswarm will split into Cirilla newsfeed, Costanzo Sabatini newsfeed, Cirilla like activity and Costanzo like activity. Then I wanted to add something for the size and I'm interested in understanding um, how many likes uh, have, have the pages that uh, Newsfeed suggests and also the page that uh, uh, the, the users are liking. So I can drag and drop page like here. And uh, okay. And by looking at the visualization, you start uh, detecting that uh, there's something interesting in this visualization. Not really interesting, but I mean, it's <laughs> something changing here. Then, Mm, we can also add the color, like for instance, the category box, because I want to also see uh, which are those pages where the word vaccine is contained. So if I go down, okay, now it's not really visible, but actually there are some dots which are orange. Then we will customize the visualization in order to better emphasize those, uh, those elements. And then we can also add labels. So for instance, I define this uh, uh, column, which is label VAX, uh, which are basically the how highlighted, uh, highlighted items, highlighted uh, liked pages, uh, but with the label. So if we drag and drop the label, we can see that here, only the label related to those uh, pages with the VAX, uh, the vaccine terms inside are, uh, are shown. So once why we have uh, uh, mapped our dimension into the variable, so once we have uh, encoded our values into our visualization, we have to scroll down and to understand how should we customize our visualization in order to make it understandable or useful, both for presenting it in a, in a in a slideshow or for using it as a tool for producing new knowledge. Um, here on the left, you have this panel where you can tune the, the width and the height of the visualization, for instance. So you can do it uh, um, proportional to, you can create a visualization which is proportional to your screen, for instance. I can say, okay, one. 1024 to 
seven, six, eight. Great. Okay. okay. Let's say that we have this. Oh my God. This visualization. I can change the color of the background. I prefer white, but anyway, you can do it. Okay. White. Okay. Here with the margin, you can set up the margin. So you can, for instance, since you see here that we have some labels and here that we have some labels that go uh, out, uh, we can, for instance, add some margin to right, to the right and to the left. Oops, no, sorry, I wrong. To the right and to the left. You can also change the bottom. Okay, now everything is better. Then um, what we can do is also to decide to show the legend or not. Yes, if we, if we pick yes, we will have the legend here ready for, I mean, uh, you, but in this case it's showing us uh, the, 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 what, what does size mean and what does color mean. Then, okay, once we finished uh, to customize uh, the artboard, we then can open the chart uh, section, which is dedicated to tune the elements uh, of, the of the chart, of the visualization intended as data points, okay? Here, we can change the minimum diameter. In this case, of this, of this specific visual model, we can change the minimum diameter. So in this case, we can also, instead of 10, we can say 20. Oh, oh, no. oh no. Sorry. Something is. Okay. Uh, minimum diameter, 20. Okay. And maximum diameter, we can say, for instance, 100. OK, this is a problem because actually the, the, the artboard is too, too small for, um, for this visualization. So OK, we can come back and say like 5 and 20. OK, now it's better. Uh, we can change the padding between the nodes, so the space between the different dots and the way in which uh, those nodes are um, closer. Uh, so it's uh, something like the simulation that you have in the first atlas when you work with JP. So the way in which uh, uh, small items uh, um, change their position according to different strengths. But I won't do it now because I'm afraid that uh, with Zoom open, it's going to crash. Then, we have the series, so the way in which those, block, those groups are organized. So for instance, I can decide to organize them by name. So I have the first two, like activity and newsfeed from Cirilla, which was the one with the Facebook of activity. So this is super strange because actually Facebook started to um, suggest many different pages. Uh, more more pages uh, to 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 Costanzo who hasn't any kind of uh, uh, Facebook activity Facebook of activity and then then I can close it then I can open the colors and uh, I can change the color scheme so I can use uh, some colors that are provided directly from uh, from from Rograph but I can also find uh, uh, other colors that I think are more in a way this is very basic thing red and green but I mean you are free to to change the color as as you prefer like this okay and then I can also tune labels so I can change uh, the font of the label I can use this primary secondary or italic style and uh, what is interesting is that I can also auto hide uh, labels. So some labels uh, could be like uh, deleted because, uh, but this is an algorithm that I try to highlight those labels that uh, are overlapped. So sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't make sense. So it's up to you to decide if it's. Uh, if the labels that uh, Rograph is suggesting you to keep are enough for, for you or not. In general, you can also keep these uh, 
um, organization of label and maybe tune the dimension of the visualization uh, in order to uh, make more space for showing labels. Um, you can also show the outline of the label, so maybe you can see something more, but uh, I'm not really okay with these. Uh, 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 I would, sh I would uh, decide to uh, how to add some label, but I want to change this color because I want to highlight uh, uh, those pages with a vaccino inside, so probably I would like to like, yes, in this case, uh, could be like purple and uh, no, could be gray. Okay. Okay. So in this case, uh, the way in which I'm choosing color help the user or the reader to detect uh, which are those elements that I want to highlight. Once I've done with my visualization and I'm happy with it, I can export the visualization in four different ways. I can export an SVG visualization, which is a vector format. I don't know if you are familiar with Illustrator or Inkscape, uh, but you can download an SVG and you can edit it as a vector graphic. So you can edit all the shapes and so on. Uh, you can download it as a PNG or a JPEG. Is it downloaded? Okay, or JPEG, it's the same, more or less, are raster images, but you can also download the project. And this is very interesting because if I start again on a new page, I use it through a graph, and instead of uploading data, I open my project, I can upload my project and see the same thing here. Okay, so this is, uh, this is a way for saving your uh, results in raw graph. But uh, we have our beautiful visualization in JPEG, which is that one. Let's, say, let's see what we can do for adding information. This is the last thing that uh, we are going to do. I want to, okay. So let's say that we wanted to create this visualization, which is annotated. We create a new slide, not with this, a blank, blank slide. And I, I'm using a, a Google Slide or PowerPoint or whatever, because I would like to show you that uh, it's not necessary to have, uh, uh, I don't know, very complex uh, tools uh, for, uh, for creating a visualization that helps you in producing knowledge, communicating knowledge. But what you need is just uh, sometimes uh, you can do a lot only with PowerPoint or with uh, a Google Slide uh, presentation. Of course, if you are able to use Illustrator and so on, you can maybe produce visualization that are um, clearer. You can change uh, maybe the label size in a more uh, efficient way. But uh, um, I mean, since the data visualization is uh, cross-disciplinary, it's multidisciplinary, yes, uh, there are some data visualization designer, as I am, that uh, um, are used to do uh, graphics, specific, maybe more complex visualization, because we are studying it. But uh, I think that the data visualization could be really be exploited by every one of us uh, for uh, for producing knowledge and communicating knowledge. And sometimes uh, PowerPoint is enough or Google Slide is enough. So let's say that we want to present this visualization. So we have uh, in our downloads, we have our JPEG or PNG, which is the better one, or reboot both of them. Maybe PNG is better. Okay, so we put it here. Perfect. So we have already the legend. And we have also the, um, the axis here. So as I told you before, let's make like a title. Let's put a title. Uh, I will copy this because we don't have so much time if we wanted to also have some Q&A session. So let's put a title here. We can choose, we can try 
where you can put title, like in this case, okay? And we can also say highlight, uh, maybe we can write a text, a small introduction to text, where we highlight, uh, I like on a chain of term, I don't know, something like that. Uh, so we can move it just a little bit on the left. Then, uh, for instance, uh, what I wanted to, 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 to put here is that uh, for that time interval, so from uh, Thursday the 15th of April and Saturday the 17th of April, I don't have any data because uh, I was polluting the... Um, I was polluting the, the, the accounts, the profiles. So this is important, this is necessary. So what I can do is to basically, for instance, I can use these, uh, no, maybe I can use a line. I can create a line here with Google Slides, with the tool provided by Google Slide. I can make those line dotted. And like this, I can use a square, let's say, for highlighting this area. Only using this, it's fine. I can change, uh, customize the, the opacity, okay? And I can add an annotation by using a text box saying pollution, for instance, of the user of the user of the profile then of course you are you should be better than me in finding more interesting terms for defining actions like those and i can also use the arcs for connecting uh, for connecting annotation to visual elements that I add on the slide. Then uh, I can also, for instance, uh, mm, let's say that I want to show maybe this uh, section. I can screenshot this. Now it's not so beautiful, but uh, I can use a screenshot of of a specific part of the visualization for make it, for maybe say something more about this. So I can use this as a zoom, for instance, of this. Maybe that I can put here. If it's maybe not here, but maybe it's smaller some, somewhere here. And I can give more information about this because maybe I need to make a zoom for make it, make it bigger. Uh, then, for instance, uh, I noticed that uh, here there were label. Uh, I mean, one of those elements uh, was uh, referendum contro uh, la libertà di, per la libertà di scelta, which was this, uh, this page, uh, referendum sulla libertà di scelta. Okay, this. This was a, a page that I was interested in too, because I noticed uh, last time when I was looking for those pages, that when I'm looking for uh, pages that contain the term vaccino inside, Facebook uh, is not showing the page itself, but before it tried to push me to look at uh, uh, official information in the World Health Organization page. And this is something, for instance, that could be interesting to put inside visualization. This is a matter of choices. So it's, it's up to you, of course. But I can, for instance, copy and paste this, this label, okay? Put it here because it was that one, let's say. And I will take those screenshots here from this and I can paste it here. 
I can put it for instance here, those, and I can make a big arrow that connects. Those. This and this. More or less. Okay. Like this. And I can add more specific information, like I did here when searching for vaccine or related pages, Facebook suggests the World Health Organization page instead of the searched one. And I can, so instead of putting this, I can organize the text in a way that the user can understand what I'm referring to. Okay. Okay, now it's not really well cropped, but. Uh, the idea is that uh, yeah, we can put zoom in and so on. And then we can use it as a slide and uh, we can use it, uh, also save it and use uh, it as a screenshot. And uh, I mean, and we can also, if we want, uh, add a small visualization here for instance, another visualization that relates to this, let's say, one minute, yes, one minute. Let's say that we want to uh, use only a section, only a portion of our data, only Cirilla page likes. Let's say that very, very, very quickly. We copy, for instance, this. Mm -hmm. And on row graph, we use it, row graph, we copy and paste again those data. And instead of representing the time frame, uh, we want just to, okay, no, this is, okay. We want just, uh, wait, that I didn't copy the, um, the header. So let's take this. Only Cirilla, Milano, okay, those four line. Let's say that we want to visualize it as a separate graph. We use row for copy and paste it. And we use uh, I don't know, a stacked, uh, no, we can they do a bubble chart, no, a circle packing, let's say in order to see uh, all the, the pages that appeared on her newsfeed according to the, the amount of likes. We can do something like this. Okay. With a label. Okay. And we have here, for instance, uh, only uh, the pages that appeared on Cirilla uh, newsfeed. And for instance, we can, again, let's change the color very quickly. Okay. And we can download it as a PNG here. And why not, coming back to our visualization, use it as another visualization, maybe smaller visualization, to put here in order to show the, not uh, the amount of pages uh, a long time, but maybe to show just uh, the, uh, the sum of all the pages uh, a long time. Okay, it, this is just an example. You can put also it here and make an arrow, for instance. Um, okay, yes, this was super quick because I think that we are running out of time. Uh, so basically what we, <laughs> uh, what I want to say as just a conclusion is that uh, um, as we, uh, we have seen today, uh, data visualization is really uh, as a long history and its roots are really in uh, astrono uh, in astronomy and statistics and this makes everything really really interesting uh, for instance to me 
but also we have also seen how different type of uh, uh, experts uh, has worked have, have worked with the data visualization across time. Uh, visualizing for digital methods, it's uh, a, a process basically. It's always a process, and this is the reason why I wanted to underline the, the role of the visualization as a tool uh, for uh, knowledge production and knowledge development. So, um, and I hope that those uh, information, those notions will help you in developing visualization uh, in your career, in your work, uh, or during your free time, if you want to uh, play with data and uh, create some visualization. Uh, and that's it. What I, I was showing you with PowerPoint and Google Slides, you can do it also with Photoshop or Illustrator, of course. But I, I really uh, believe in uh, open access. Uh, and so I was trying to find a way for helping you in creating meaningful visualization and useful visualization also with tools that uh, are not, uh, uh, have not, are not to be paid or are not, uh, Mm, yes, by, by, in a way, uh, are not a payment thing, so, and that's it. So thank you very much. I, let me know if you have any questions, let me know if you, maybe something was not clear, or if you want, you can also write or drop me an email, or whenever you want, and, uh, and that's it. Thank you very much for, for everything. Thank you, Beatrice. I think that was uh, very insightful and helpful. Uh, are there any comments, questions, or interventions from the audience? Yes, if I can. Thank you, Beatrice, for your interesting uh, you. lecture, really. Um, so uh, practically, we can use uh, you, um, tracking ex exposed also to track YouTube uh, videos, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, can you show us, us uh, something about this part? So how we can uh, use tracking exposed for YouTube? Okay. Uh, yes. I mean, for YouTube, I have to download it actually because I never used it on my laptop. Um, but I think, I mean, it's going to be like an experiment altogether because I use the tracking exposed for Facebook. I can show you the tracking exposed for Facebook and then maybe... Mm -hmm. um, we can we can apply on, uh, we can apply on um, yeah of course okay because tracking exposed uh, mm, Facebook YouTube and for nab uh, on from Facebook here you can download or uh, install the browser extension which is uh, this extension here you see this uh, this one uh, we okay, can here. see your uh, screen I know right I I I stopped. You're right, again. Okay, so uh, tracking, can you see it now? Yes. Yeah, okay. Tracking exposed for uh, Facebook. Here we have tracking exposed in general and tra tracking exposed for Facebook. This is the website of tracking exposed. Uh, you can go on YouTube or Facebook. On Facebook, uh, you can download and install the Facebook tracking exposed browser extension. Um, and you have to use it or Chrome or Brave or Firefox. Now I'm using Chrome uh, and I have this extension here. Uh, what happens is that uh, when you go on Facebook, uh, let's say, let's open Brave because there I have the information about uh, the, other, um, the other users because I'm not sure that you're interested in looking at my information on Facebook. So I have, okay, Costanzo Sabatini, which is uh, our, one of the user that uh, uh, we, we use for, for our uh, experiment. And uh, if I go on the news feed, for instance, okay, and I activate here the extension, which is that one, okay. I can see, wait, uh, I can see here. Uh, 
I can show things, everything here. Okay, you see? And it should work that when I refresh, because this is the system. Okay. It should work with some, if it's working right now, that some tags appears on each post. Okay, now it's not appearing because probably. But there would be, I don't know why it's not working now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyway, uh, it's not working the, the tag, but uh, let's say that we want to scroll. I mean, we scroll all our news feed. And then if we click on evidence list, And now it's still uh, still uh, not ready. We can we have to scroll a lot, <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot. And uh, theoretically, it will show the evidence list. I mean, all the posts that uh, we are scrolling. The problem is that uh, face the tracking exposed uh, at least for Facebook. Mm, no, it's, it's working better with API. So the work that I did uh, last time for collecting data was by connecting directly to the API. Now it's not working. We should ask Claudio what's happening. Mm -mm -mm. Let's say what's happening because it seems that it's not activated. Mm, this is strange. Mm, no, probably there's something don't want to not be working. necessarily conspiratorial, but it may be an API setting of Facebook that prevents this to work properly now. Maybe we should. Uh, I don't know. Claudio know. Anyway, I would ask Claudio. I would yeah. ask Claudio. Maybe maybe he knows. Maybe there's a you know that these things change. Maybe probably. So probably. If we connect to the API, because uh, I have, for instance, the API here, of uh, probably we would see that. Uh, let's say, okay, actually the API are working. Uh, okay, API are working because actually those are the information about uh, um, today. First, okay. no, la, no, two years, three years ago. No, maybe I'm not working right now because this was the first of June, so three years ago. Hmm. Strange. Days ago. Yeah, yeah, probably something has happened. So tracking exposed is not super. Sometimes, especially for Facebook, is not really stable. But, but it's, uh, it's not tracking exposed fault. It's Facebook's fault. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. They have to change. I mean, I'm always in contact with Claudio. And every time I said, okay, Claudio, please change this because it's not working right now. And it's always like this. Yeah, so that probably. The point. The, the, yeah. Also for our, uh, for our students, perhaps are less familiar with this tool. Uh, unfortunately, Facebook in particular, but in general, these settings uh, mm. for platforms change uh, sometimes very suddenly and uh, something yeah. that was working yesterday night is no longer working now. So. Exactly. This, uh, this is normal. There was a question from Massimiliano, I think, who raised his hand. Yes, yes, I'd like to ask if uh, uh, is uh, tracking ex exposed the only service that can do this kind of work? I'm, I'm wondering because uh, I've seen that it's limited to four platforms and I would be mm. interested in doing it on other platforms such as Spotify, where there are some trackers but that can be used for research purposes but they don't have this kind of uh, degree mm. of detail so i'm wondering if uh, there is any other uh, service that can that offers this okay. kind okay no actually uh, there are, i mean to my knowledge uh, there are no other services that can do something like this uh, because uh, these the, the way in which uh, tracking exposed uh, is uh, i mean collect information is a way of uh, passive reading of what you are looking in your screen and basically collect information uh, this way 
and they are now focused more on Pornhub and YouTube, less on Facebook. And maybe this is also the reason why uh, I have every time to ping Claudio for uh, fixing uh, problems. Uh, for instance, uh, um, I noticed that since last month, I um, I used to collect, no, two months ago, I used to collect the data uh, by hand. So the same thing, but by hand. So step by step by recording the screen, by looking at what was happening and which, which were my reaction. I did this work by hand and okay, it was super, super long, uh, but uh, um, I mean, it was super interesting because actually I had the opportunity to look inside each news uh, to see more detail in, in, in a more detailed way, uh, all the posts, all the pages. To my knowledge, uh, there is just tracking exposed or maybe there are some scrapers online uh, that can do it, uh, um, but it's a form of auditing in a way that it's not so common to find. Uh, so yes, so so far I, I know just the tracking exposed or your hand and uh, it's spreadsheet where you can take notes. But of course uh, there would be more uh, more tools, maybe more complex. Uh, or the, the fact is that tracking exposed is thought to be a tool that uh, allows you also to see from your interface what's happening. Now Facebook is not working. You can try with YouTube or with uh, with Pornhub maybe and they, it should work, probably. If I can add Did something you? on, uh, specifically on Massimiliano's point, with mm -hmm. my colleagues here in uh, uh, the University of Milan at the mm -hmm. Informatics Department, we are working on a tool which should have been ready by the summer school I wanted to show, mm -hmm. but uh, it's not yet from a technical perspective, on Spotify, oh. uh, that has uh, some features that are similar to Tracking Expose. It's sort of a in between the YouTube data tools that I showed yesterday and the Tracking Expose features. Uh, but it's, I mean, it should have been ready. It's not for a number of technical reasons that sometimes these platforms give you until the very last moment before you release them. So um, once it's available, of course, I can make the link available to all summer school participants and I guess particularly to you if that's of interest. Thanks. It's of great interest to me. Thank okay. you. Noted. There is a compliment from Osain Shariar in the chat. For, uh, oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Lecture, which I very appreciate and myself too. Anyone else has a comment or question for Beatrice? Oh, so many compliments. Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Please. Uh, yeah, yeah, probably was super. Yes, I tried to uh, uh, give you many information, but because uh, I mean, I think that during a summer school, also this kind of uh, information overload, it's something that uh, we are used <laughs> to, to do. But then uh, if you have time to digest and to think about it, I mean, if you want really read the, the brief history of data visualization paper, which is very, very interesting. It's a Michael Friendly paper. It's, it's really a nice uh, point of view on, on the topic. Okay, then, if okay. there are no more uh, pressing comments or questions, I have virtual applause for Beatrice, who has been, uh, as usual, uh, brilliant in, in a uh, lecture and thank you very much for uh, for being with us this morning thank um, you we will uh, now stop the recording mm -hmm. yeah. we don't need it anymore <laughs>